Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have this evening to come and to worship you and to sing songs of praise to you. We pray, God, that our worship this evening will be in spirit and in truth and will be according to your word. We pray, God, that you will continue to bless the church that meets here. We pray that you will help us to be a shining light in this community. We pray that you'll continue to 
be with our elders. I pray that you will give them the wisdom and the knowledge that they need in the making the decisions that they make. We want to pray, God, for the church the world over. We pray, God, that you will bless every congregation and every member. We know that there are some that are going through some struggles right now, and we pray that you will, you will be with them. We pray, God, for those who are sick. We pray that you will be with those mentioned in our bulletin and the ones in our announcements. We pray that you will be with them and restore them to their much-wanted and needed health. God, we pray that you will be with those who are bereaved. We pray that you will comfort them in a way that only you know how. We pray, God, that you will be with those who are traveling. We pray that you will help them to reach their destination safely, and we pray that you will return them to us safely. And we thank you for those who have been traveling and are, are back with us. We thank you for their safe trip. We pray, God, that you will go with us now through the remainder of this service. We pray that you will open our hearts and open our minds and help us to Take in those things that we are about to hear and apply them to our lives. We pray, God, that you will forgive us when we fail to do those things that you would have us to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to mark number 271, 271, that'll be the song of invitation. For our lesson this evening, if you'll stand please, we'll sing number 397, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be. <clears throat> we read of a place that's called heaven, it's made for the pure and the free. Robert, that was a look of relief when I came back in that door. <laughs> I forgot something, and I knew it was just sitting right on my, de uh, on my love seat in there, and I said, I better, I'm almost going to go grab that real quick. But that was funny seeing Robert's face when I stepped out the door and <laughs> stepped back in. <laughs> and Robert's thinking, all right, what else could we lead here? <laughs> it's good to be back this evening, and... Uh, we had a good weekend. Several, several of our Bremen young folks went and spent uh, part or most of the weekend in Jacksonville. 
And I, I've told several people that this is the first year they've done that. It was called Upward. But uh, it seemed, seemed like uh, very similar to Yes Weekend. A lot of the kids said they thought it was uh, similar in a lot of ways to Yes Weekend as well. But uh, I enjoyed being there for the time that I was there. And then uh, the kids said they really had a good time as well and enjoyed it very much. So uh, I was privileged even just to be uh, allowed to be a part of that. And so I appreciate uh, Johnny and uh, Bob and, and the, the others who... Uh, covered and, and especially is it for the elders allow me to be away for an opportunity like that 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 does uh, that that's kind of a shot in the arm for me uh, number one because I got to I got to listen to uh, preaching this morning I, I presented a lesson during the Bible class hour but then I got to listen to Chris Clevenger uh, speak for the worship hour but also just being around young folks who are enthusiastic about serving the Lord is, is an encouraging thing for me uh, tonight as you see it's up there right yeah uh, is our book of the month. I think we mentioned this a week or so back, this being the fourth Sunday night of the month. Uh, we're looking at the book of Esther. Uh, if, if you're like me, you thought it was, it was a nice, nice change to have a shorter book this month. We've, we've done 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles in one month. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah are a little shorter, but not quite as short as Esther, so uh, that's nice. But uh, this, this is our book of the month, and this is a, a great... Great book. I, I, there's so much that could be said about Esther, even though it's short, that obviously we, we'd have to pick and choose for time's sake, but one, one fellow ob observed that Esther reads more, um, it almost reads like a novelette. There, there's just, there's, there's a plot, and you got these characters, and some of this we'll look at as we go along, but it's just, it has a different feel to it all around, and there are some different things about this book. It, it's a unique book. Of course, one of only two books in the Bible named after a woman, Ruth being the other one. But let's talk about the book of Esther. And again, some of this is just going to be condensed down for time's sake, just because that's what we have to do, because there's just a lot that could be said about this, uh, this particular book. The historical setting. Let, let's talk about that. When does it take place? Obviously, it takes place, I, I guess we would say, post captivities post-captivity, although we, we might be tempted to say captivity because not everybody went home from captivity, as you recall. A number of Jews did, and we talked about that in Ezra. Uh, Nehemiah comes to work on the walls, but Ezra leads a group coming back, uh, going back to the homeland, but not everybody returned. Some of them remained in this foreign land. Some of them were in Babylon, later on Susa or Shushan, depending on the version you have, same, same city, same area, and, it's, and, and even beyond there. So the historical setting is, is Joshua is, is looking at this in comparison to the others. Joshua through Esther, that section of Scripture covers, that ends with this book we're looking at now, <clears throat> 12 books of Scripture, covers a, approximately 1,000 years of Old Testament history. This is your last, I, I guess we would call it, historical book of the Old Testament. There's a lot, basically every other book of the Bible fits into what we have looked at from Genesis through Esther. You know, we'll, we'll come to Job, Lord willing, next month. That fits in your patriarchal period, which will be, most, most scholars say the events in Job probably happened shortly after the flood, sometime not too long after the flood. Uh, prophets, you have them falling within, sometimes during the United Kingdom, sometimes during the Divided Kingdom, uh, sometimes even overlapping. But everything's going to fall somewhere between Genesis and Esther that, we've, that we've, we'll study in the remainder of the Old Testament. So it's about a thousand years of Old Testament history. Uh, you're talking from the entrance into the Promised Land to the end of Old Testament period, which, you know, as we talked about last month in, in looking at Nehemiah, probably would have been uh, somewhere, some, pe some folks will say uh, late 430s, even going on to about, you see the date I've got there, 432 B.C., Nehemiah rebuilding the walls. That'd be about your last chronological event, and we talked about that last month. But the last three books of this section, Joshua through Esther, covers the final Old Testament history. That is the post-exilic history, we would say, after the exile. So Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. We've talked about Ezra and Nehemiah, so we're looking at Esther. The events fit between the first and the second returns of the Jews from captivity. First one was led by Zerubbabel, somewhere around 536. Second one led by Ezra, somewhere around 458 B.C. Now, another way of looking at this is, I have a, a note in my Bible, I don't think it's in this particular Bible, but 
uh, in, in one of my Bibles, I think it's my, my older Bible, I have a note at the top of the page where Ezra 6 ends and Ezra 7 begins. And I just have a note that the events of Esther occur between these chapters. So if that is helpful, you may want to do that. That's one way I try to remember this is it, when Ezra 6 ends, you could just, as it were, insert the book of Esther between that first and second return of the Jews. You're talking a period in the book of Esther about 20 years. Now, one, for, one person, fellow I read, said 10 years. So it's somewhere between 10 and 20 years. Depends on which scholar you're reading, who you ask, and how you date the events. And somewhere between 10 and 20 years. So not that long a period of time covered here. Uh, Esther, very likely, we don't know for sure, but it's possible and maybe even likely that she lived into the reign of Artaxerxes, which was the king under whom Nehemiah was commissioned to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, which would probably explain why he got a lot of assistance and, and a great deal of cooperation from Artaxerxes because of Esther's influence. And so again, you see, God is, God's working here. The people are in captivity. They've, they've been punished for their sins. They've gone home, but, but not everybody went home. Did God just forget about them? No, God's still taking care of them. God is still at work, even, even in that setting. So that's your historical setting. Uh, l- let's talk about the author and the date of the book. We, we, don't, we don't know who wrote the book other than that it was written by inspiration. Some people speculate it might have been Mordecai. Some people speculate Ezra. If you don't know who Mordecai is, we'll talk about him in just a moment. Uh, some people speculate maybe Ezra or Mo- Mordecai wrote it uh, using uh, official Persian documents for portions of the book. And again, obviously writing overarching by the inspiration of the Spirit. But look at chapter 2, verse 23. Inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out, therefore <clears throat> they were both hanged on a tree and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Now this is in the context of Mordecai discovering a plot and making sure the king knows about it. It was a plot against the king's life and so they take these two traitors, they hang them. But, but I want you to notice the end of verse 23, it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. They had these chronicles, these official documents, they'd write these things down. Later on, the king can't sleep, and he wants, to, he wants somebody to come and read to him from the chronicles or the archives. So some people speculate maybe it was Mordecai, maybe it was Ezra. They wrote this book using, uh, at least in part, some of those documents. That, that may or may not be. We don't really know the official date. We know it was sometime after the captivity, after the uh, Jews were allowed to return home. So just by the fact that you have Ahasuerus mentioned and things like that give you some idea of the date, but we don't know for sure. Principal characters. I think most of us are familiar with this, with the characters in the account of Esther, but just to make sure we understand, king is, the, the Persian king is Ahasuerus. Uh, many folks have talked about him as being a spineless, wavering character. You don't get as much of that in this book. You, you learn that more from secular history about the man. Uh, he, this does not happen in the book, by the way, and I meant to put something up there just so you notice, but Uh, he was assassinated at somewhere around 365 B.C. That's not in the book, but that's just to say that finally, at some point, it was two of his own uh, military folks. They'd had enough, and they had a conspiracy, and they killed him. Uh, He was not the most upstanding fellow is what we're trying to get at here. Uh, He was was wavering in his character, and, and as one fellow put it, spineless. A lot of folks suspect when he had this great feast where he calls Vashti out and wants to parade her out in front of everyone, that this was the feast getting ready to launch and go attack the Greeks, uh, which, which he had this force amassed that was just unbelievable. It, it, you would have looked at it and said, that is an unbeatable force. And yet the Greeks pulled off the upset, we would say. And so what happens is Ahasuerus comes home and now he's, he's pouting. He's, he came home to lick his wounds, and so he wants, to, he wants to satiate himself, gratify himself physically, and so he has this harem of women. And that's what happens when he gets home, and uh, some of the events begin to unfold in the book as well. Now, that's what some folks speculate, and it seems to hold up when you look at secular history. But that's the king, the Persian king. Then, of course, you have Queen Vashti. Her modesty cost her the crown. The king, in his intoxicated state, he says, come out here and show everybody how beautiful you are. 
And I, I, almost to a man, the scholars agree, what he was asking for was her to come out and parade herself openly, unclothed, so that everyone could see how beautiful his queen was. Now, a lot of scholars also point out about Vashti that being queen and having these, even some of the Jews as her servants, that there's a pretty good chance she was cruel and mistreated them on some occasions. We don't, we're not told anything about that in this book, but it certainly is a possibility. All that to say, whatever might have, flaws she might have had, and we know she had some, if nothing else, but for the fact she was human. But this woman had a sense of decency, a sense of decency that's lacking even sometimes in modern day and age. And she said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to just parade myself out there in front of all these men. I'm not doing that. You can almost picture that scene unfolding. You know, the king saying, do what? What did you just say to me? Did, did you say no? Her modesty cost her the crown. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Mordecai, great man of integrity, a Jewish man. He loved his people. He's going to do whatever he can to save them from the events that began to unfold in this book. Esther, the name means star. Her Hebrew name is Hadassah or Hadassah. It means myrtle tree. She certainly does become a star, uh, the star of this particular account. And then, of course, you have the wicked villain, Haman. Here, here is a morally, spiritually bankrupt man. He is so full of himself that he can't even be happy with all the glory he has in the kingdom as a great man of, of stature among the Persians. He even says on one occasion, all this avails me nothing so long as I see that Jew Mordecai. Why? Because Mordecai wouldn't just fall at his feet and say, the great Haman. He just couldn't stand it. And he said, I will never be happy, no matter what great honor I have until that man is dead. And I want his people dead too. You talk a man so eat up, talk about a man so eaten up with prejudice he had it something terrible. And so there are your main characters within this particular account. Let's talk about the message of the book. Uh, it, it's, again, this is, this is your only biblical record of the Jews who didn't return home but chose to remain in Persia. Some of them may have remained in a subservient role as far as being servants and things like that, but by and large, they've, they've been released. And it may very well have been that, we're not really told in the Bible, but it may have been that the king said, if you want to go home, go home, but if you stay, you'll, you'll remain in a subservient position. You're not going to be considered, you know, equal citizens. Be that as it may, the only biblical account we have of the ones who stayed behind is right here in Esther. But, but again, one of the things that we see in this book is God didn't forget about them. God didn't just say, oh, you, you're going to stay we don't even know all the reasons they had for staying. But God says, I'm not just going to ignore you. You're still my people. You may have heard this before about the book of Esther. It's one of the things that people remember as a curiosity about the book. God's name is never mentioned. Go ahead and read the book. Beginning to end, you'll never find the name of God. You won't even find a reference to prayer. Fasting is mentioned, but, but not prayer specifically. Those two usually went together, if you remember when we talked about fasting. But God's name is not mentioned in the book. And, and a lot of people are troubled by that. We'll talk more about that in just a second. But his hand is unmistakable in this book. You, you cannot mistake the hand of God working providentially in this book. God doesn't always have to have a miracle to work things out. He certainly is capable of such. And on occasion, he used it. I mean, one time he had Moses just stretch a rod out. And God parted an entire sea. And Israel walks across on dry land. But God doesn't have to work through a miracle. Sometimes he's working through providence. And specifically here, he's working with the Redeemer in view. One fellow, Matthew Henry, he said, If the name of God is not here, his finger is. The finger of God is present throughout this account when you read about what's going on in the book of Esther. But the message of the book really and truly centers around God's sovereignty. God is in control. Don't ever forget that. That's 
that is really so much of the Old Testament. God is reminding his people, he's reminding us and everybody from now till time ends, I'm in control, God says. Whether it's Nebuchadnezzar, whether it's Pharaoh, whether it's a wicked man like Haman, he says, you're, you're not in control. Jehovah runs this show. And Jehovah is bringing his Messiah into the world. You will not stop that. Jesus on one occasion said, upon this rock I will build my church. I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The gates of Hades pr cannot prevail against it. I guarantee you no mere mortal can. So God is in control. His, his providence protected his people even though he wasn't working miraculously. And, and again, ultimately, this is all with a view to bringing in the Christ. That's, that's the big picture view here. The Messiah is coming. And so Israel, the nation, the people, they are, they are as one fellow used the term, the, the incubator in which the Christ is going to come or from which the Christ is going to come. So God's going to make sure if the, if the people are destroyed, then... Where does the Christ come from? The seed line can be destroyed. So God is going to protect his people in the book of Esther. Now, let's talk about the question of why there's, why there's no mention of God in the book. This is, this is really troubling to some people. In fact, I will admit the first time I heard it, I thought, well, that, that is, you know, that's super strange. What, what is the deal with that? Why would God not even be mentioned in the book? It's also interesting, by the way, that the book, Esther, there are no quotes from it in the New Testament. Now, that's not really that troubling because there are other books that, that we could say the same of. Um, I'm trying to think. I know Song of Solomon is one, and I'm getting ahead of myself to the, when we talk about that book, but there are no quotes from it in the New Testament. But God's name, of course, is mentioned in Song of Solomon. It's interesting because some people way back when thought that, that Esther doesn't belong in the Old Testament canon. It's not a part of Old Testament scripture because God's name is not mentioned, and we should not include this book in our Bibles. That was what they decided. What about that? Well, one thing I want us to notice about the book is, in, in the Hebrew, it begins with the word and, A-N-D, and. That shows there's a connection to something else. If you pick up a book and it begins and, or it begins in a certain way that makes it very obvious it's connected to another book, then you start, you know, I mean, sometimes I've, I've read a book before. I don't, I don't remember what it was, but I read a book one time and I was very early in the first chapter and I said, I'm not reading the first book in this series. It was very obvious, painfully obvious early on. I, I'm not reading the first book in this series. There's something else. And so, you know, you go and you Google it or research it online or go to the library or whatever, and sure enough, there, there's more. That's what you see with Esther. When it begins with and, it shows it's connected to something else. And, and in fact, in the Hebrew Bible, it was connected to Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah. They, they were a unit in the Hebrew Bible. So the Jews understood it was a part of the Old Testament canon. It belonged in Scripture. It, it, it is Scripture. And we've talked about that before, by the way. Keep that in mind. A vote doesn't determine what goes in the Bible, folks. It either is inspired scripture or it's not. It's only on us to recognize it, whether properly or improperly. Uh, men can vote unanimously to include a Bible. So that's, that's scripture. But if it's not, then it's not. And men could vote unanimously and say that a particular book, that doesn't belong in the Bible. You remember Martin Luther, he didn't like the book of James, and he just tore it out, and he said he called it a right strawy epistle, and he didn't like it talking about faith and works. Well, everybody could get together and vote with him unanimously. Oh, that, that, that book, James, doesn't belong, but doesn't change the fact, folks. So canon is not something that man determines. God determines that. But I want to notice something else. Somewhere around 100 B.C., there was an apocryphal work that came out, and it's called The Rest of Esther. And it appeared trying to fix this perceived a problem. It's not really a problem at all, but they perceived, many people perceived it as a problem, and so it came out. And, and that's why I wanted to go in there a while ago and get this, because I, uh, I have here a Holy Trinity edition of the Catholic Bible. There was a sister in uh, Memphis, and she 
she was a widow and she had a large house and she would house a student. That was kind of one of the ways she supported a preaching student. So I lived there for a little while and unfortunately she left this life during that time, but her family gave me a lot of the books that her and her husband had. And one of them was her husband, he left the Catholic Church to become a New Testament Christian. So I have this book and when you start looking at the Old Testament, sometimes you, you go, what, what are these books? What is this? But when you get to Esther, and I lost it, I'll probably never find it now. Uh, I got in a hurry a while ago, Robert, and I closed it. But when you get to Esther, it, it, instead of ending at chapter 10, verse 3, it just goes right on into what we would call the rest of Esther. I thought I had it, but I don't. But it goes right on into the rest of Esther, and it's a pretty lengthy section. And, and we know it's, it's not the same. And, and what's ironic to me is, like in this Bible, uh, it, it, like I said, it's an apocryphal word. You've heard of the Apocrypha, and, and the Apocrypha is included in most Catholic Bibles. I would dare say all Catholic Bibles. Is that correct? Uh, so, but you know it doesn't, it's, it doesn't fit with the original book of Esther because, for one thing, the, the rest of Esther, as it's called, is written in Greek. Esther is written in Hebrew. You've got two different languages. Two different time periods. Esther had been around a long time before the apocryphal rest of Esther came along. But anyway, long story short, what you get into, what you get into with the rest of Esther, the apocryphal work is, I read it, I got, got this book down the other day and read it just to see what it was saying. And it's almost like it goes and retells the story of Esther with one difference. It peppers it with God's name. <laughs> Somebody just thought, we got to fix this. And so they went back and kind of paraphrased the story, and it's very similar. And they, they threw God's name in several times. There you go, problem solved, now it belongs in the Bible. But the problem is the rest of Esther is, is an uninspired portion. Someone wrote that just trying to, perfect, to fix what they perceived to be a problem, which never really was a problem. There are also, by the way, some, some gross inaccuracies within the rest of Esther that also tells us it's an uninspired work. But it's all about, you see what I'm getting at, it's all about somebody saying, well, we got to do something about this book, not mentioning God's name. As if we could just add an addition to it and suddenly it becomes inspired. So what is, what is the reason for God's name not being here? I don't know that I could tell you 100% what the reason is. That's one of those things, we'll live right and go to heaven and ask God and we'll get there. But it's possible because of using the official Persian documents. We mentioned that while ago when looking at chapter 2, verse 23. You'll also notice sometimes in this book that Mordecai is called the Jew. Why would he just be called the Jew? He's obviously one of the heroes in this story. Esther is called the queen. She's, she's the hero. She, she would be the hero, I suppose. Your, your, your main character, one. She, Esther, the queen. Maybe that they're using some official documents there, and so that's... Uh, that could be some of the reason. Uh, it's interesting, by the way, I think this explains a lot, if you ask me, this, that's my opinion, but W.G. Scroggy noted that the divine name, Yahweh, we say it, we don't really know how to pronounce it, it would transliterate to Y-H-W-H, -H, uh, the tetragrammaton, sometimes people call it, the Jews wouldn't pronounce the name because they were so afraid they would use it in vain. And so to this day, we don't really 100% for sure know how to pronounce the name of the God in heaven who we often refer to as Jehovah. We don't know if that's exactly the way to pronounce it, Jehovah, Yahweh. But Scroggy noted that in the Hebrew manuscripts, at critical points in the story, chapter 1, verse 20, chapter 5, verse 4, chapter 5, verse 13, chapter 7, verse 7, you see God's name appear in acrostic form. Now, we don't see that in the English because it doesn't carry over. It's kind of like writing a poem and then translate it to another language, and, you know, it just doesn't work, right? He noted that God's name does appear in acrostic form. But all that aside, folks, you, you read this book, and it's clear. You, you may not see God's name, but you cannot miss his presence in the book over and over and over. Let's look at an outline of the book of Esther. As you see there on the slide, this is very, very slightly adapted from Brother J.W. McGarvey. Uh, three, three main sections of the book of Esther. Esther becomes queen, chapter 1 through chapter 2. I'm going to go ahead and put the other two, three, uh, yeah, two points up here on the slide. Second 
section is Haman's plot to exterminate the Jews. He wants them gone, chapters 3 through chapter 5. And then the third major section is the downfall of Haman and the deliverance of the Jews, and of course that's chapter 6 through the end of the book, which is chapter 10, verse 3. Now, looking at kind of unpacking the first section just a little bit, Ahasuerus has this council and a feast, and, and he's having this, this drunken feast, and uh, these people are uh, they're, they're drinking, and they're having a good time, and of course then he, he calls on Vashti to come and parade herself before them. She refuses. His, uh, his advisors come to him, and they say, look, uh, all the women in the kingdom are going to hear this, and they're going to start refusing to do whatever their husbands say. You, you've got to do something about this. What you need to do is you need to depose her as queen and select a new queen. That'll teach her a lesson, and that'll send a message to all the other women in the kingdom. They were, they were pretty worried about this thing, you know. So that's what he does. He says, we're just going to depose Vashti, and we're going to find ourselves a new queen. And that's what he plans to do. We're introduced to Mordecai and Esther in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Esther is chosen, of course, she's very beautiful. The king loves her. She's chosen, and then... At the end of chapter 2, Mordecai uncovers this plot to kill the king. He makes it known. The traitors are found out. They're hanged, killed. And so the king's life is spared. Then you come to the second section. That's Haman's plot to exterminate the Jews. He, he's promoted. Haman is. He, he's promoted and he comes up with this plan to get rid of the Jews. He can't stand it because, again, Mordecai won't bow to him. Won't show him reverence. And so he wants Mordecai and all the Jews out of the way. So there's this promotion of Haman. Then there's uh, a day selected and a decree issued where on a certain day the Jews were to be killed, exterminated. Mordecai mourns over this. He lets Esther know, and you come to a key section in the book, chap chapter 4, verses 10 to 17, where Esther is encouraged to, to go in and petition the king on behalf of her people. The key section is right there in verses 13 and 14. Mordecai commanded toward Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Hey, Esther, you're a Jew too. You're going to die if this thing comes to pass. If you don't do something, you know, he had already encouraged her to go talk to the king, and she said, Look, you know the rule. If I go talk to the king, he hasn't called me. He has not called me with like something, I think she says, 30 days uh, into one of those verses. Yeah, into verse 11. He hasn't called me in in 30 days, and if I just go and approach him, then I can, my life could be forfeit unless he extends the scepter. And so verse 13, Mordecai says, look, you're a Jew too, so you're going to die when this thing goes down. In verse 14, he says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance rise to the Jews from another place. He says, God's not letting his people become exterminated. He's not letting his people be wiped out. Deliverance is coming from somewhere. Hey, Esther, wouldn't, wouldn't you like for it to be you? How about you offer yourself up in service to the God of heaven? And if you die, you die, but you know you die in service to God and that he's going to take care of you in what's important, and that's eternity. And he says, but thou and thy, thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. If you don't do anything, you're going to be destroyed in your father's house. God's going to send salvation from somewhere. So he's going to take care of his people because he's going to keep his promise to Abraham. And thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed, the, the Messiah. But, but watch this. He says, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Esther, what if God put you here? What if God put you in that position where you are right now for this exact moment? What if he did that? And then you just blow it off and say, well, you know, that's risky. The king hasn't called me in, and I don't know if I want to take that risk. He says, maybe God put you here for this particular moment. And I love her response. She says, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan. Fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maids will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Esther is encouraged to go and petition the king. She's accepted by the king. He does extend the scepter. She invites him and Haman to a banquet. And then, of course, you have Haman's plot against Mordecai and his, you, you can't call it anything else except his whiny 
uh, speech about how he can't be happy no matter what he has in life until Mordecai is dead. And that's when they come up with the plan. They suggest it to him. He loves it. They say, what you should do is build a gallows. And you can hang him on that gallows when the appointed day comes around. And, of course, that leads us to the, the third section, the downfall of Haman and the deliverance of the Jews. Uh, Mordecai is honored. Haman is distressed. <laughs> I love chapter 6. The king can't sleep one night, and he says, uh, bring me the records. I guess if you, if you ever can't sleep, have somebody read historical records to you, right? That'll solve the problem. Um, but he, he says, bring the records to me. And they start reading, and he says, they, they read about Mordecai uncovering this plot against the king, and he says, what was done for that man? I mean, he saved my life. And they say, well, you know, we we're looking here, and it looks apparently nothing. We got to honor this fellow. Call Haman in here. Haman, what, what do you think should happen to the man in whom the king delights? And Haman's got all these things. He thinks to himself, in whom could the king delight but good old Haman? I mean, so he lays it on thick. And he says, oh, I would, I would elevate that guy. I mean, he would just basically be, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, basically, he would be second in command. I mean, I would really honor that guy, king. And he says, you know what, you're right. Go get Mordecai and do everything just like you said. Can you imagine the, the talk about taking the air out of the wind out of your sails, as they say. So Mordecai is honored and Haman is distressed, to say the least. Haman is exposed. They have this feast and Esther exposes him and says, King, the king loves Esther. I mean, that's, that's his bride. And Haman messed up because he's gone after the king's bride. He didn't even realize it himself. She says, I, I'm a Jew. These are my people. And Haman has devised this plan. Haman, in a desperation attempt there in chapter 7, he just kind of, he, he's, he's basically just falling prostrate before her, begging for some kind of mercy. The king had turned away. He turns back and he sees this and he says, what, is he trying to go after her now? Will he force himself on the queen? And that makes him even angrier. And, and you know the rest of the story. They go and they hang Haman on his own gallows that he'd made for Mordecai. Mordecai takes Haman's place. Another petition is granted to Esther. A new decree is issued. Remember the law of the Medes and the Persians? We've been talking about this in the book of Daniel. It can't be altered. And so the king says, I, I can't take back the decree. I can't just say, hey, that's one of the things, by the way, in the rest of Esther that I read. It's a, it's, it's a complete contradiction because it, the king even says here, I can't just nullify the law. In the, in the book, in the rest of Esther, he says, you know, we're taking that back. Ignore that. But he can't do that. And so he makes a new decree. And the decree says what? Well, on the day that everybody's allowed to attack the Jews and kill them, now they're allowed to attack and defend themselves. So if you attack them, get ready to be attacked back. They're going to defend themselves. So that was kind of his way of handling that. The Jews destroy their enemies in chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. The Feast of Purim is instituted as kind of a celebration of this victory for the Jews, the people of God. And you see the king's power and Mordecai's glory there in chapter 10 as the book closes out. So much more we could talk about. Let's close with just a couple of four, actually, lessons from the book of Esther. A lot of things we could learn from this book, but, but these four, I think, stick out most of all. Vashti's modesty. Modesty is, it, it's a problem in our time. There, I don't think you need me to tell you that, but it, it's not necessarily a new problem. Sometimes it gets better or worse than others, but you see Vashti, she was dethroned because she stood for something. She wasn't going to compromise on that. I think there's a lesson in that. Her modesty, even from a heathen queen, is an example that, you know, there may be circumstances where it's not easy. It doesn't change the fact that modesty is right. And, and modesty another sermon for another time, but it's more than to do with than just with clothing. It, it is a, a state of the heart. And that, like I said, that's something we could talk about more another time. But her, her modesty, every time I read the account of Esther, don't miss in the beginning of, of this account Vashti standing up for what is right. Standing for modesty. Readiness for service. From the New King James Version, I, we read this just a moment ago, but 
chapter 4, verses 13 and on into 14a. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Readiness for service to God. And going right with that is lesson number three, and that's the rest of verse 14. Who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows, Esther? You see great lessons about God's providence in this book, but you also see a, a lesson about being ready for God's service. When you have an opportunity to serve God, sometimes think, Maybe God has been working providentially in my life to give me this opportunity. I don't mind telling you, it's been, I think, four, two years and four months. No, two years and ten months, something. I don't know, it's been a while. Uh, but I don't mind telling you that I honestly believe that God worked providentially in my life. And when... The elders here called us and said, we'd like for you to come and work with the congregation. That was a, that was a tough decision. Not, not because I, I didn't know what I needed to do, but because it's just it's not easy. It's not easy to move. It's not easy to say goodbye to people that you care about. And there are a lot of other things that go with that. But, and I, I wrestled with that. And I thought, maybe this is where the Lord's trying to put us. And having, having done that, I believe that's the case. We don't always know, and that's one of the things with providence. It's easier in hindsight, and sometimes even then you don't know for sure. But readiness for service to say, where can I be of most service to God? Where can I be in position to give his name the most glory? We, we too often, starting right here, we too often say, I, I want the easier way. I want the way that, that works out better or feels better for me. But let's look for the way that brings God the most glory. And then again, the overarching theme here is God's sovereignty. It, this whole book is Psalm 67, 66, verse 7 could sum it up in a nutshell. He ruleth, God ruleth by his power forever. His eyes behold the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Whether you're Haman, whether you're the king, whether you're whoever, even Satan himself, don't exalt yourself because you will not triumph over God Almighty. What a great, great book this little book of Esther is. As we close our thoughts out here tonight, so many great lessons we could take from Esther, but don't forget the big picture. Faithful service to God doesn't go unnoticed. God is working in this world. He's working through his providence, and that's true even to this day. Maybe you're not a child of God. Maybe that's what you need now, to come and confess your faith in Jesus Christ as the Savior. That's what this is all about. God's bringing the Savior. And when we reap the benefits of that now, in its fullest form, Peter tells us in 1 Peter, these things angels desire to look into. Maybe you need to become a Christian, confess Christ as Lord, and be buried in the watery grave and raised up to walk in newness of life. Maybe as a child of God, you say, I haven't taken advantage of those opportunities I need to take a cue from Esther and say, you know, uh, maybe I've been put here for, for this time. Maybe I've been put here to serve God in this capacity. Look for ways to glorify God's name and serve him. Whatever your need may be, if we can help you in any way in getting your life right with the Lord, that's why we extend heaven's invitation. Won't you come as we stand and sing? Why can't you?
recap the announcements before our closing song and prayer this evening and before the Lads Leaders slideshow. Please remember Roger Lane, Frida Gray, Florine King, Al Jones, Lou Overby, and Keith Pollard in your prayers this week. Also remember the family of Dustin Black, who is Kristen King's stepbrother who recently passed away. Lads Leaders pizza party is tonight. As soon as we close this evening, everyone invited. Brothers Keepers groups one and two need to set up before, and groups three and four need to clean up. Say, so Ladies Devo Thursday, May the 7th, 11 o'clock. Please bring Mexican food to that. Our youth day will be May 9th from 9.30 to 2. The theme is Heaven's Road. Camp and a Gay 5K race and one mile fun run will be this Saturday, May 2nd at Clinton Preserve. Georgia School of, Bib of Preaching, rather, Bible Lectureship will be May 2nd and 3rd at Piedmont Road Congregation in Kennesaw. Lithia Springs has, has a gospel meeting coming up May 3rd through 7th. Terry Wheeler speaking. Please remember the slideshow as soon as we're done here this evening. Also, the uh, Lord, Lord's Supper is available in the library if you need to take that. And if you'll stand, we'll sing number five and then have our closing prayer. All the way. Father, Lord, we're thankful for this day and another first day of the week, Lord, that we're able to come out and study another portion of your word and sing these songs, Lord, of praise. Lord, please be with those who are sick and unable to be here tonight. Lord, please keep them safe and help them, Lord, to return to their health. Lord, please be with their doctors and, Lord, the ones that are taking care of them, that they know the things to do to get them well. Lord, please forgive us of our sins, Lord. Please help us, Lord, to to uh, be able to go out and, and be shining examples, Lord, to the world that we're Christians. And, and uh, Lord, please be with us as we depart here tonight and keep us safe this week. And we ask these things in Christ's name we pray. Amen.